Babbitt by Sinclair Lewis. Chapter Two. Relieved of Babbitt's bumbling and the soft grunts with which his wife expressed the sympathy she was too experienced to feel and much too experienced not to show, their bedroom settled instantly into impersonality. It gave on the sleeping porch. It served both of them as dressing room, and on the coldest nights Babbitt luxuriously gave up the duty of being manly and retreated to the bed inside to curl his toes in the warmth and laugh at the January gale. The room displayed a modest and pleasant color scheme, after one of the best standard designs of the decorator who did the interiors for most of the speculative builders' houses in Zenith. The walls were gray, the woodwork white, the rug a serene blue, and very much like mahogany was the furniture. The bureau, with its great clear mirror, Mrs. Babbitt's dressing-table with toilet articles of almost solid silver, the plain twin beds, between them a table holding a standard electric bedside lamp, a glass for water, and a standard bedside book with colored illustrations. What particular book it was cannot be ascertained, since no one had ever opened it. The mattresses were firm, but not hard, triumphant modern mattresses, which had cost a great deal of money. The hot water radiator was of exactly the proper scientific surface for the cubic contents of the room. The windows were large and easily opened, with the best catches and cords, and holland roller shades guaranteed not to crack. It was a masterpiece among bedrooms, right out of cheerful modern houses for medium incomes. Only it had nothing to do with the Babbitts, nor with anyone else. If people had ever lived and loved there, read thrillers at midnight and lain in beautiful indolence on a Sunday morning. There were no signs of it. It had the air of being a very good room in a very good hotel. One expected the chambermaid to come in and make it ready for people, who would stay but one night, go without looking back, and never think of it again. Every second house in Floral Heights had a bedroom precisely like this. The Babbitt's house was five years old. It was all as competent and glossy as this bedroom. It had the best of taste, the best of inexpensive rugs, a simple and laudable architecture, and the latest conveniences. Throughout, electricity took the place of candles and slatternly hearth fires. Along the bedroom baseboard were three plugs for electric lamps, concealed by little brass doors. In the halls were plugs for the vacuum cleaner, and in the living room plugs for the piano lamp for the electric fan. The trim dining room, with its admirable oak buffet, its leaded glass cupboard, its creamy plaster walls, its modest scene of a salmon expiring upon a pile of oysters, had plugs which supplied the electric percolator and the electric toaster. In fact, there was but one thing wrong with the Babbitt house. It was not a home. 2. Often of a morning Babbitt came bouncing and jesting into breakfast. But things were mysteriously awry today. As he pontifically treaded the upper hall, he looked into Verona's bedroom and protested. What's the use of giving a family a high-class house when they don't appreciate it? Tend to do business and get down to brass tacks. He marched upon them. Verona, a dumpy brown-haired girl, twenty-two, just out of Brian Meyer, given to solicitudes about duty and sex and God, and the unconquerable bagginess of the gray sports suit she was now wearing. Ted, Theodore Roosevelt Babbitt, a decorative boy of seventeen. Tinka, Catherine, still a baby at ten, with radiant red hair and a thin skin which hinted of too much candy and too many ice-cream sodas. Babbitt did not show his vague irritation as he tramped in. He really disliked being a family tyrant and his nagging was as meaningless as it was frequent. He shouted at Tinkett, "'Well, Kitty Doodle!' It was the only pet name in his vocabulary except for the deer and hun, with which he recognized his wife, and he flung it at Tinka every morning. He gulped a cup of coffee in the hope of pacifying his stomach and his soul. His stomach ceased to feel as though it did not belong to him, but Verona began to be conscientious and annoying, and abruptly there returned to Babbitt the doubts regarding life and families and business, which had clawed at him when his dream life and the slim fairy girl had fled. 
Verona had for six months been filing clerk at the Gruensburg Leather Company offices, with a prospect of becoming secretary to Mr. Gruensburg, and thus, as Babbitt defined it, getting some good out of your expensive college education till you're ready to marry and settle down. But now, said Verona, Father, I was talking to a classmate of mine that's working for the Associated Charities. Oh, Dad, there's the sweet little babies that come to the milk station there and feel as though I ought to be doing something worthwhile like that. What do you mean worthwhile? If you get to be Gutenberg's secretary, and maybe you would if you kept up your shorthand and didn't go sneaking off to concert and talk fest every evening, I guess you'll find thirty-five or forty bones a week worthwhile. I know, but, oh, I want to contribute. I wish I were working in a settlement house. I wonder if I could get one of the department stores to let me put in a welfare department and a nice restroom and chinzias and wicker chairs and so on and so forth, or I could. Now, you look here. The first thing you've got to understand is that all this uplift and flip-flop and settlement work and recreation is nothing in God's world but the entering wedge for socialism. Sooner a man learns he isn't going to be coddled, and he needn't expect a lot of free grub and uh, all these free classes and flip-flop and doodads for the kids unless he earns them, why, the sooner he'll get up on the job and produce, produce, produce. That's what the country needs, and not all this fancy stuff that just enfeebles the willpower of the working man and gives his kids a lot of notions above their class. And you— if you'd tend to business instead of fooling and fussing all the time, when I was a young man I made up my mind what I wanted to do, and stuck to it through thick and thin, and that's why I'm where I am today. Myra, what do you let this girl chop the toast up into these dinky little chunks for? Can't get your fist on to em. Half cold anyway. Ted Babbitt, junior in the Great East Lake High School, had been making hiccup-like sounds of interruption. He put her now. Say, Roan. You going to? Rona world. Ted, will you kindly not interrupt us when we're talking about serious matters? Ah, punk, said Tech judiciously. Ever since somebody slipped up and led you out of college, ammonia, you've been pulling these nut conversations about whatnots and so on and so forth. Are you going to? I want to use the car tonight. Babbitt snorted. Oh, you knew. May want it myself. Rona protested. Oh, will you do, Mr. Smarty? I'm going to take it myself. Tinker wailed. Oh, Papa, you said maybe you'd drive us down to Rosedale. Mrs. Babbitt. Careful, Tinka. Your sleeve is in the butter. They glared and Verona hurled. Ted, you're a perfect pig about the car. Of course you're not. Not at all. Ted could be maddeningly bland. You just want to grab it off right after dinner and leave it in front of some skirt's house all evening while you sit and gas about literature and the highbrows you're going to marry, if they only propose. Well, Dad oughtn't to ever let you have it. You and those beastly Joan boys drive like maniacs. The idea of your taking that turn on the Chippewa place at forty miles an hour. Ah, uh, what do you get all that stuff? You're so darn scared of the car that you drive uphill with emergency brake on. I do not. And you, always talking about how much you know about the motors, and Eunice Littlefield told me you said the battery fed the generator. You, oh, why am I a good woman? You don't know a generator from a differential. Not unreasonably was Ted Lofty with her. He was a natural mechanic, a maker and tinkerer of machines. He lifts thin blueprints for the blueprints came. That'll do now, Babbitt flung in mechanically, as he lighted the gloriously satisfying first cigar of the day and tasted the exhilarating drug of the Advocate Times headlines. Ted negotiated. Gee, honest, Roan, I don't want to take that old boat, but I promised a couple of girls here in my class I'd drive them down to the rehearsal of the school chorus, and, gee, I don't want to, but it a gentleman's got to keep his social engagements. Well, upon my word, you and your social engagements in high school. Oh, ain't we select since we went to the hen college? 
let me tell you there isn't a private school in the state that's got a swell up bunch of guys we got in gamma di gamma this year there's two fellows that their dads are millionaires say gee i ought to have a car of my own like lots of the fellows babbitt almost rose a car of your own don't you want a yacht and a house and a lot that pretty nearly takes the cake boy that can't pass his latin examinations like any other boy ought to and he expects me to give him a motor car and i suppose a chauffeur and an aeroplane maybe as a reward for the hard work he puts in going to the movies with eunice littlefield well when you see me giving you somewhat later after diplomacies ted persuaded verona to admit that she was merely going to the armory the evening to see the dog and cat show she was then ted planned to park the car in front of the candy store across from the armory and he would pick it up there were masterly arrangements regarding leaving the key and making the gasoline tank filled and passionately devotees of the great god motor they hymned a patch on the spare inner tube and the lost jack handle their truce dissolving ted observed that her friends were a scream of a bunch of stuck-up gabby four-flushers his friends she indicated were disgusting imitation sports and horrid little shrieking ignorant girls further it's disgusting of you to smoke cigarettes and so on and so forth and those clothes you've got on this morning they're too utterly ridiculous honestly simply disgusting ted balanced over to the low beveled mirror on the buffet regarding his charms and smirked his suit the latest thing in old eli togs was skin-tight with skimpy trousers to the tops of his gleaming tan boots a chorus man waistline pattern of agitated check and across the back a belt which belted nothing his scarf was an enormous black silk wad his flaxen hair was ice smooth pasted down without parting when he went to school he would add a cap with a long visor like a shovel blade proudest of all was he of his waistcoat saved for begged for plotted for a real fancy vest of fawn with polka dots of a decayed red the points astoundingly long on the lower edge but he wore a high school button a class button and a fraternity pin and none of it mattered he was supple and swift and flushed his eyes which he believed to be cynical were candidly eager but he was not over gentle he waved his hand at poor dumpy verona and drawled yes i guess you're pretty ridiculous and disgusting us and i rather guess our new necktie is some smear babbitt barked it is and while you're admiring yourself let me tell you it might add to your manly beauty if you wiped some of that egg off your mouth verona giggled momentarily victor in the greatest of great wars which is the family war ted looked at her hopelessly and shrieked at tinka for love of pete quit pouring the whole sugar bowl on your cornflakes when verona and ted were gone and tinka upstairs babbitt groaned to his wife nice family i must say i don't pretend to be a ba lamb and maybe i'm a little cross-grained at breakfast sometimes but the way they go on jab jab jabbering i simply can't stand it i swear i feel like going off some place where i can get a little peace i do think after a man spent his lifetime trying to give his kids a chance at a decent education it's pretty discouraging to hear them all the time scrapping like a bunch of hyenas and never and never curious here in the paper it says never silent for one mo see the morning paper yet no dear in twenty-three years of married life mrs babbitt had seen the paper before her husband just sixty-seven times lots of news terrible bud tornado in the south hard luck all right but this say this is corking beginning of the end for those fellows new york assembly has passed some bills that ought to completely outlaw the socialists and there's an elevator runner strike in new york and a lot of college boys are taking their places that's the stuff and mass meeting in birmingham's demanded that this mick agitator this fellow de valera be deported dead right by golly all those agitators paid with german gold anyway and we got no business interfering with the irish or any other foreign government 
keep our hands strictly off. And there's another well-authenticated rumor from Russia that Lenin is dead. That's fine. Beyond me, why we don't just step in there and kick those Bolshevik cusses out. That's so, added Mrs. Babbitt. And it says here, a fellow is inaugurated mayor in overalls, a preacher too. What do you think of that? Hmm, well. He searched for an attitude, but neither as a Republican, a Presbyterian, an elk, nor a real estate broker did he have any doctrine about preacher mayor laid down for him. So he grunted and went on. She looked sympathetic and did not hear a word. Later she would read the headlines, the society columns, and the department store advertisements. What do you know about this? Charlie McKivley, still doing his society stint as heavy as ever. Here's what that gushy woman reporter says about last night. Never is society with the big, big S, more flattered than when they are bidden to partake of good cheer at the distinguished and hospitable residence of Mr. and Mrs. Charles L. McKevely, as they were last night. Set in its spacious lawns and landscaping, one of the notable sights crowning Royal Ridge, but merry and homelike, despite its mighty stone walls and its vast rooms, famed for their decoration. Their home was thrown open last night for a dance in honor of Mr. McKevely's notable guest, Miss J. Sneath of Washington. The wide hall is so generous in its proportions that it made a perfect ballroom, its hardwood floor reflecting the charming pageant above its polished surface. Even the delights of dancing paled before the alluring opportunities of tete -a and invited the soul to loaf in the long library before the baronial fireplace or in the drawing-room with its deep comfy armchairs, its shaded lamps just made for a sly whisper of pretty nothings a do, or even in the billiard-room, where one could take a cue and show a prowess at still another game that sponsored by Cupid and Trepic Score. There was more, a great deal more, in the best urban journalistic style of Miss Elona Pearl Bates, the popular society editor of the Advocate Times. But Babbitt could not abide it. He grunted. He wrinkled the newspaper. He protested. Can you beat it? I'm willing to hand a lot of credit to Charlie McElley when we were in college together. He was just as hard up as any of us, and he made a million good bucks out of the contracting and hasn't been any dishonester or bought any more city councils than was necessary. And that's a good house of his. Though it ain't any mighty stone walls, and it ain't worth the ninety thousand it cost him, but when it comes to talking as though Charlie McKinley and all that booze hoisting set of his or any bloomin' bunch of a uh, Vanderbilt, why, it makes me tired. Demily from Mrs. Babbitt. I would like to see the inside of their house, though. It must be lovely. I've never been inside. Oh, I have. Lots of couple of times to see Chaz about business deals in the evening. It's not so much. I wouldn't want to go there for dinner with that gang of high binders. And I'll bet I'll make a whole lot more money than some of those tin horns that spend all they got on dress suits and haven't got a decent suit of underwear to their name. Hey, what do you think of this? Mrs. Babbitt was strangely unmoved by the tidings from the real estate and building column of the Advocate Times. Ashtabula Street, 496 J. K. Dawson to Thomas Mullany, April 17, 157 by 112.2, mortgage 4,000, nom. And this morning Babbitt was too disquieted to entertain her with items from mechanics liens, mortgages recorded, and contracts awarded. He rose. As he looked at her, his eyebrows seemed shaggier than usual, suddenly. Yep, maybe. Some kind of shame to not keep in touch with folks like the McKevleys. We might try inviting them to dinner some evening. Oh, thunder. It's not waste our time thinking about them. Our little bunch has a lot livelier times than those plutes. Just compare a real human like you with those neurotic birds like Lucille McKevely, all highbrow talk and dressed up like a plush horse. You're a great old girl, hon. He covered his betrayal of softness with a complaining, Say, don't let Tinka go and eat any more of those poison nut fudge. 
For heaven's sake, try to keep her from ruin her digestion. I tell you, most folks don't appreciate how important it is to have good digestion and regular habits. Be back about usual time, I guess. He kissed her. He didn't quite kiss her. He laid unmoving lips against her unflushing cheek. He hurried out to the garage, muttering, Lord, what a family! Now Myra's going to get pathetic on me because we don't train with a millionaire outfit. Oh, Lord, sometimes I'd like to quit the whole game. And the office worry and detail just as bad. And I act cranky, and I don't mean to, but I get so darn tired. End of chapter 2